Last week, I narrated the case on the amazing channel, The Crime Reel. So if any of you would like to hear another brief case narration this week, please go to the link below. Today we are going to the first part of the 20th century. So sit back as we go to Canada. Janet Kennedy Smith was born on the 26th of June 1902 in Perth in Scotland, where her father named Arthur worked as a railway fireman. The family lived in the city near the River Tay until Janet was 11 years old when her father was offered a position in England and the family moved to London. Janet was a considerate and well-behaved child and when she finished school, she started working as a nanny. The role seemed ideal for such a caring and good-natured young lady. In 1923, she was offered a position in the household of a Canadian couple named Mr. Frederick Baker and his wife, Mrs. Doreen Baker. Mrs. Baker had recently given birth to a baby girl and needed someone to assist her with her daughter as her husband was often away running his successful import-export business. In April 1924, the Bakers relocated to Paris and Janet accompanied them. Six months later, however, they returned to Canada and after some thought, Janet agreed to move to Vancouver and continue working for the family. Vancouver was a prosperous city that had benefited from the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. This had meant that trade with Britain, Europe and many other parts of the world increased as transporting goods became much faster and cheaper. As the economy grew, so did the number of people wanting to immigrate to Canada. Many from Britain, but also many people arrived from Asia. The family moved into a house belonging to Frederick Baker's brother, named Richard Plunkett Baker, at 3851 Osler Avenue. This was in the upmarket Shaughnessy Heights area of the city. As Frederick and Doreen settled in, Janet would spend more time caring for the baby. The weather was pleasant, similar to London, and she enjoyed pushing the pram around, making the most of the spring sunshine. As well as being such a caring young lady, she was also very pretty, and gentlemen would often seek her acquaintance, one of who was a 24-year-old man who lived and worked in the house. His name was Wong Foon Singh, and he had arrived in Vancouver from China 10 years earlier. He was employed to undertake various domestic tasks for Mr. Richard Baker. Wong, however, was already married. When Janet had free time, she would sometimes go out into the city. Prohibition had ended three years earlier, and there were many interesting places to visit. She was known to be quite flirtatious, and very much liked the attention of her male admirers. On the 26th of July, 1924, just three months after Mr. and Mrs. Baker had arrived back in Vancouver, Wong heard a loud noise. He thought it may have been a car backfiring, but when he looked out of the kitchen window, he soon realised that the sound was something else. Aware that Janet was ironing in the basement, he decided to go and see if she was alright. Wong would not miss an opportunity to see Janet. He was quite taken by her and had been known to give her small presents to try and court her affections. As he made his way to the basement, he noticed that Janet was lying on the floor, with blood coming from her head. Wong rushed for help and telephoned Frederick Baker, asking him what he should do. Mr Baker rushed back to the house. When the two men looked at Janet, they realised that she was dead, and Frederick called the police. Constable James Green was sent to the house and inspected the scene. He observed that the deceased had a bullet wound to her forehead, and a gun was very close to her body. Strangely, he picked up the gun, and without really inspecting the scene or looking for evidence, he concluded that the young lady had taken her own life. In 1924, when someone had died in these circumstances, the Canadian authorities would normally have insisted on the deceased having an autopsy performed. But for some reason, in this case, undertakers were summoned and instructed by both the coroner and the police to embalm the body. Once this had taken place, an autopsy was carried out, but as the body had already gone through the embalming process, any evidence that would help the police ascertain the cause of death had been destroyed. The pathologist was able to find evidence that the gunshot residue 
suggested the gun had been fired from a distance. He also found that the deceased had a cracked cranium and part of her scalp had been partially separated from her skull. The pathologist named Dr. Hunter presented his findings at the inquest, where it was decided that Janet Smith's death was accidental. The coroner theorized that the injuries to her skull were caused when she fell and hit her head after she had shot herself. Following the inquest, Janet was buried at the Mountain View Cemetery. Many people didn't believe that Janet Smith had taken her own life. To them, it just didn't seem right that the popular and warm-hearted young lady, who was very happy in Vancouver, had died in such mysterious circumstances. They tried to get the case reopened and asked for recently formed United Council of Scottish Societies to help them. Their attempts didn't seem to be going anywhere until the newspaper, The Vancouver Star, published a story questioning the evidence and how the police failed to conduct a proper investigation. Other newspapers also took an interest in the mysterious circumstances regarding Janet Smith's death and soon began to publish stories. Pressure mounted on the authorities to reopen the case and eventually Inspector Forbes Cruikshank, the head of the Vancouver Division of the British Columbia Police Force and like Janet, originally from Scotland, was tasked with investigating the events of the 26th of July, 1924. He interviewed Janet's friends, who told him about Wong Fu Sing's fascination with her. He also discovered that the gun used was owned by Richard Baker, who at the time was away in Europe with his wife. Unfortunately, it was not possible to obtain any fingerprints, as Constable Green had handled it when he arrived at the scene. Inspector Forbes Cruikshank examined Janet's diary and summarised that she seemed to have been a flirtatious young lady who liked the male attention she was attracting. There was nothing in it to suggest that she was intimidated by Wong's friendship towards her. Wong, however, had heard the shot and had found Janet in the basement. The inspector thought that he was worth investigating. He asked a private detective named Oscar Robinson to follow him. He did this for a few days before eventually picking him up in Chinatown and escorting him back to the Canadian Detective Bureau, where he was interviewed. They did their best to intimidate him and try to make Wong confess. However, his story was consistent throughout and he maintained that he had already told the police everything he knew. The papers continued to run the story. They sensed that something was not quite right about the case and as pressure mounted on the authorities, Janet Smith's body was exhumed and a second post-mortem was conducted the results of which were shared at a second inquest that started at the end of August. The inquest was more thorough, her diary was read out, and Janet's friends were called as witnesses. The crime scene was described in detail, as was the failure of the police to conduct a proper investigation. After a week of testimony and debate, it was concluded that the cause of Janet Smith's death was murder. Special Prosecutor Malcolm Bruce Jackson was appointed to run the case and the newspapers kept on asking as to what actually happened at 3851 Osler Avenue on the 26th of July 1924. Apart from the baby, the only other person in the house was Wong, so suspicion kept on coming back to him. Chinese people had been arriving in Canada since the mid-19th century and by 1860, the Chinese population in British Columbia was estimated to be around 7,000. Many of the first Chinese immigrants arrived from rural areas in southern China. They worked hard, often under very difficult conditions, and between 1880 and 1885, many helped build the Canadian Pacific Railway. The investigation didn't seem to be providing any new leads, but the Scottish societies were determined not to let the case be forgotten. They had the support, of the first female member of the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia, a lady named Mary Ellen Smith, who was originally from England. She attempted to introduce legislation which would prohibit white women from being employed to work in households that also employed Chinese men. The bill was presented in November 1924 and called the Janet Smith Bill. It was never passed, but managed to put the spotlight back onto the investigation. As 1924 ended and 1925 arrived, the case again started to receive far less coverage in the press. 
no one had been charged with the crime and other events were occupying the minds of the residents of Vancouver. Then, at the end of March, Wong Foon Singh was reported missing. Again, the case started to be reported and as Wong failed to reappear, speculation mounted that he had returned to China as he was guilty of the murder of Janet Smith. However, on the 1st of May, he was found on Marine Drive, where he had been dropped off blindfolded by the people who had held him captive for the previous six weeks. Wong told the police that he had been abducted from the baker's residence at 3851 Oster Avenue by men dressed like members of the Ku Klux Klan. He said they had chained him up and tried to extract a confession, but as they could not make him change his story, they eventually released him. The Janet Smith case was again headline news and became even more intriguing when it was discovered that the abductors included some high-ranking police officers, a detective sergeant and officials of the city's Scottish societies. Following his terrible six-week ordeal, Wong Foon Singh was again interrogated by detectives investigating the case and despite him telling them the same story that he had when he was first interviewed on the day of the incident, he was arrested and charged with the murder of Janet Smith. The trial of Wong Foon Singh started in October 1925 and the Chinese Benevolent Association hired the very well regarded lawyer, John Harold Senkler, to defend him. The case however did not last long and was thrown out of court due to lack of evidence. Wong, now a free man, returned to work for the Bakers. The people behind his abduction were also put on trial. Three of these were found guilty and received prison sentences, and four more were acquitted. The Janet Smith case remained unsolved, and the story was no longer headline news. As time passed, other crimes and other issues filled the Vancouver newspapers. In 1926, Wong Foon Singh decided to return to China, and police stopped investigating the case. Theories did emerge as to what actually happened to Janet. One which seemed to have some merit is that there was a party at 3851 Oster Avenue on Friday the 25th of July. Some of the guests were high-ranking officials. There was a lot of alcohol and illegal substances being consumed. And when one of the guests who had been spending some time with Janet accidentally pushed her, she fell and hit her head. When it was apparent that she had died, an attempt was made to try and make her death seem like suicide, as no one wanted the party or the death investigated. Frederick Baker, however, dismissed this theory as nonsense, but later it emerged that Scotland Yard in London wanted to speak to him, as they believed his import-export business was dealing in illegal narcotics. When this became known, people who were still anxious to know exactly what happened to Janet decided that anything Frederick said about the case could not be considered as credible. Some theorised that Janet discovered the illegal activities that Mr Baker was involved in and her demise was so she would never be able to speak about it. Another story that gained interest was that Jack Nicholl, who was the son of former Daily Province publisher and Lieutenant Governor Walter Nicholl, allegedly told his nurse just before he died that he was having a liaison with Janet at the party and accidentally knocked her over. She hit her head on the bathroom sink. When it was obvious that she had died, the suicide was constructed as to not bring unwanted attention onto himself or his father. The picture on the screen now was taken just before Janet died. She never got to see it. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. There is a link below to the case I narrated last week on the Crime Reel channel. It would be great if you have time to check it out. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case. <laughs>